Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Today, we're going to be talking about the Wilson Pro Staffs from 1983 until today. All right, so stay tuned for this one. Alright guys, so today is going to be a pro staff day. My buddy Angus here, um, thank you for joining me Angus today. You're welcome. Uh, my buddy Angus here and I were talking and we're like, we should do a pro staff show dedicated to the iconic racket called the Wilson Pro Staff. It's had a long standing run, still going on today. This racket goes all the way back to wood. Now. Angus, I deem, is a pro staff connoisseur and a historian with these rackets. So we have a whole collection of these here today. There's actually more, but there's not enough room on this table. So, Angus, where did this iconic racket start? Well, it actually started with the Jack Kramer. Um, and there's actually several versions of this. And the very first portable pro staff was a variant of the very popular Jack Kramer autograph model. Um, but after this came out, uh, Wilson made another one, and they just called it Jack Kramer Pro Staff. And that's how it really started. All right, so this is the Jack Kramer autograph model. Um, but we don't, for some reason, this wall does not have the Pro Staff model, there's three Jack Kramer autograph ones on this wall, but all of them are the autograph model, the more popular model. So unfortunately, we can't show you one of those as we don't have it. Um, but it, I'm sure it looked just like this, right? The iconic white front with the wooden sides and then trademark Wilson symbol as it still, um, you know, lands today. Um, just no more Kramer, guys. Okay, so let's actually dive into the most iconic pro staff that ever lives, I think. Um, I'm going to take out this modern version. So, pro staff as we know it, for those of you who don't know, um, Wilson is a Chicago-based company, and these rackets were actually made in the USA in Chicago. We want to show you a couple of things that actually uh, distinguishes a pro staff of old versus a remake. So first, what are we looking at here? It's an old school white butt cap of the Wilson. Right? If you look at a new one, they don't look like that. Like this is a remake. As you can see, that's a modern butt cap. Yeah. It's a modern butt cap. This is a semi-modern butt cap, right? Yeah. This is... Still looking at maybe 90s to 2000s, kind of a butt cap. They, right they there. use that during the hypercarbon uh, years of Wilson's. That's right. Yeah. Hypercarbon years, right yeah. there. For those of you who don't know, also, Chicago first, but that was very short lived. They moved the, the production plant to where? St. Vincent. St. Vincent, yep. the most iconic place of where these pro staffs were made. It's where Pete Sampras wanted his rackets from. They moved from St. Vincent to um, Taiwan after that. So are you telling me that the Taiwan rackets were for stores and St. Vincent was just for Pete? I like to think so. There are so many models of these, and there's little nuances. What are the, the tell telltale signs that it's a St. Vincent? So I think usually if you have a St. Vincent model, uh, you want to look at the uh, the bike cap. Uh, and at the, at the bottom of the W, there's going to be a letter code, like a three letter code. Mm -hmm. And chances are, if you have an X in there, then you have a really good chance of landing the you know iconic St. Vincent model that was you know specifically requested by Pete Sampras. 
I'm not saying that the one you have was actually used by these hackers. We just requested those graphics from that factory. The reason, one of the main reasons why Sanford requested models from the St. Vincent factory is because, for whatever reason, the St. Vincent rackets are stiffer than other rackets. Um, and if you follow Sanford when he was playing, I mean, the guy played with a 70 pounds tension uh, strain bag. So, yeah, you, kind of, you can kind of get, a, get the sense that he liked stiff rackets. He didn't even want his string bag to have any flex. So this, after Sampras and Edberg, became Roger's racket, or was Roger's racket for a little bit before he was Roger. Yeah. The year that he beat Sampras at Wimbledon, I think it was like the round of 16, he was still using... He was still using this. Yeah, he was still oh. using the 6085. So let's, let's talk about transitioning out of Sampras. Um, before Sampras actually retired, there was a Pro Staff 88. Oh, yeah. That really, I mean, I think they wanted it to be the next best thing, but it, it turned out to be a little on the heavier side. Yeah. Um, he may have stuck with it for, or at least the a cosmetic version of it for two, three years, right at the end of his career. Yeah. Uh, it didn't do wonderfully at, uh, at retail. So we all know like these Pro Staff 6 lineage frames are really heavy, uh, but what they did with the uh, with the 88 was actually made it even more heavy, and to make it worse, they made it more pet heavy and less pet light. So combined with a heavier static weight and the fact that it was it was it, it, it swung more of a hammer, so it was even more unwieldy than a typical 85, um, you know, and, and, and by the time the 88 came out, people were already sort of tired of the 85 because mm -hmm. at the time the game was changing, there was a lot less serve and volley at, you know, at even Wimbledon, so the 85 made less and less sense. Um, and then when the 88 came out, I don't even, I, I don't even know if you can even say that it was more forgiving, you know, based on the three square inch difference, but the fact that it was heavier and less head light made it much more difficult to use. Right. It may have been perfect for Pete, but it's probably the only person who could actually use it. Agreed. I mean, it was, like you said, it's been 83 to let's say 2003, that's 20 years of People, you know, these being on the market, anybody can buy it. People were getting tired of them, right? You had the age of profiles, you had the age of hammers that have already gone by. You're into the hyper hammer stage, and uh, people were kind of more into recreational racket. And it was kind of the dawn of Babylon pure drives. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, honestly, that's probably what killed it. Yeah. So moving on to the next face, the next face of Pro Staff and the next iteration of Pro Staff, we only really went uh, five square inches more into a 90 now. And we put a new name on here. We put Roger's name on here. Now, what happened here? Uh, well, this racket, this is the, uh, the BLX version. Um, and there were, I think, I think there were four versions before this one because after the 85 and the 88, there was the uh, ProSap Tour 90. That's right. The all black with the yellow inside. Um, and then after that, it was the, the Enco version, then the K Factor, which everybody loves. But I have to say that there was a difference between the K Factor and on. Mm -hmm and the K factor and before. Oh. Kind of like two generations. So um, if you look at the, um, if you look at the 85, any of those versions, you will notice that the sweet spot or the center of the string, the crosses are closer together. Okay. So you have a On dense, these. yeah. So you have a denser pattern uh, with the 85 and they actually kept that for the first Pro Step Tour 90 and the end code. Oh, so, okay. And then the K factor and on, they went with sort of a, an even spacing so that your sweet spot was more open 
which of course will give you more spin. But the any the the encoder and before it kept the layout of the A drive. Interesting. Yeah. The cool thing about this racket and um, and at, at that time, you know, I think that anybody who was using the 85 would call these rackets a blessing because they kept the same weight, they kept the same balance, but they gave you more areas to use on the head. It was a 90 versus an 85. They even kept the same beam width of 17 millimeters. Um, and that to me is what makes these older pro staff special is that box beam. 17 millimeter beam, so, yeah. So the new face, I mean, there's obviously four generations in between these two. Uh, yeah. I remember that PS, I thought they called it PS61, that first generation after this one, that nobody even really bought, and then now it's kind of a sought after racket. All oh my God, summer. those things are incredibly expensive. I, I know, but nobody wanted them when they were out, which is yeah. the weirdest thing. Yeah. So moving on to this one. Oh, so what? What? What's the deal with this one? It's got. It's still braided graphite and Kevlar. Are these braided graphite and Kevlar? These are all eighty percent graphite, twenty percent Kevlar. So I use everything you see on this table. I use, um, but the major difference between this PLX and this last generation ProSat ninety is that I found this white one, the one that Roger never used because he had moved on to the 97 at the time, this was the closest thing to your favorite 6085 in terms of feel. Really? And also, when by the time this came along, I think it was suffering the same thing that the 85 suffered, that people yeah. were just tired of 90. Right. Um, that, that market was sinking, basically, yeah. going smaller and smaller. Nobody wanted to be that purist anymore. Yeah. Um, but this one, the BLX version, the one that everyone hates, um, and I think it's, again, I think it's, the, it's because this came out when, I guess, Roger didn't win much, um, and this didn't get a whole lot of attention. But to me, this was probably my favorite. It didn't feel like a 6080, uh, 6085. It was really close, but of all the 90s, this had the longest dwell time upon impact. This racket is special to me because I could really feel the beam and the head of the racket sort of conforming to the ball upon impact. So uh, moving on to modern day tennis, modern day Roger, oh, yeah. this one was the first pro staff that was not 85, not 90, not 88, 97 with a thicker beam, mm -hmm. RF logo, RF endorsed, 97 now. I feel that this is the best playing one of all, um, even till today. It's like four generations, maybe more removed now. <laughs> but this is still the best one. Uh, you listen to Wilson, they say that all of the iterations after this 97, they're all cosmetic changes. When they say cosmetic changes, those cosmetic can actually change the play of the racket. Because when you, this is a shiny finish, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime you put a matte finish on a racket, you actually dole out the feel, at least in my opinion. Anytime that you feel that it's a, a matte or a dull finish, it, it, it's kind of a dampening agent yeah. to the racket. It doesn't let the vibration or the feel come through to your hand. Whereas that, you know, you, I feel like you feel everything. I agree. I mean, even to today, I mean, in the all black versions, um, I still like that one. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not as, sensitive to these processes. I don't really use them. I only use them when I play test, but I, I know for a fact that out of all the generations, that one feels the best. Um, I've also seen that this head guard fits a few, and then they change the head guards, which tells me that they change the string patterns a little bit in some of the middle generations. Yeah. So these are actually, 
you know, from start to finish, not including a couple in the beginning, which is the wood um, into today, are what we deem as pro staffs. So that is our history of Wilson pro staffs. Um, I'm glad we got to share that with everybody yeah. out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Angus, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having uh, me. It was fun. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Thank you. No, thank thank you. you. That was awesome.